To avoid catastrophic climate change, it's clear we can no longer power our lives with fossil fuels like coal, gas or oil. The green alternative has been renewables like wind and solar, but now some influential environmentalists are looking again at the other low-carbon option, nuclear power. The new movie Pandora's Promise is arguing that nuclear power stations are not as dangerous as we all think, while on the other hand, the renewable option is just not realistic in terms of how it could replace fossil fuels quickly enough to prevent runaway climate change. But are they right? Nick Dunlop runs the Climate Parliament, a network of parliamentarians currently very active in the European Parliament and elsewhere to make the case for renewables. Why does he think people are wrong to dismiss the practicality of renewable energy? I think the problem is that most people are thinking too small scale, and most people are thinking about renewables just within their nation state. And in most nation states and all the nation states of Europe, the scale is too small. You know, Britain or Germany are smaller than a weather system, so there's times when there's a lot of wind, there's times when there's not much wind. You can't rely on wind power to power your economy every day of the year. We have to think in continental terms. We have to plug everybody into, into the solar power and often good wind power that you find in deserts to the, uh, the, the unlimited wind power that you have offshore on windy seas and on many coastlines and to the big mountain ranges, which are like the batteries that, that, that can supply power on demand to, uh, to balance fluctuations in wind and sun. Now, if you think about that globally, Europe has the Alps and the Scandinavian mountains as, as the big batteries. It's got unlimited solar in the desert. We've got great wind in northern Europe and in North Africa. Uh, you put those together with a supergrid, as, as, it's, as it's called, with those electricity highways, and you've got as much clean energy as you will ever need now and in the future. Southern Africa has, has, has deserts in the southwest, wind on the southwest coast, good hydro in, uh, in the Congo Basin. Put that together, you could power the whole of Africa. North America, you've got deserts in the southwest in the United States and Mexico. You've got good hydro up in Quebec. You've got wind on both coasts and in the Great Plains. You've got all the energy you could ever need to power the, 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 the whole of North America. The same in East Asia with fantastic wind power, not only in the Chinese interior, but in the China Sea, with big hydro resources in the mountains in, the, in, in western China, desert in Inner Mongolia. Uh, if you want to go f far enough south, you've got great geothermal in Indonesia and unlimited solar in the Australian desert. Connect all that up with electricity cables, just following the pathways that telecoms cables follow now, uh, and you could power the whole of East Asia and so on. So, you know, this is a global solution that works. It works forever. It's not that expensive in term, terms of energy investment. The amounts required are not that big. Um, so we should get on and do it. If you take an area of uh, desert in North Africa, it doesn't have to be one area. You can sprinkle your power stations across the whole region. But uh, just imagine that you, that, that you drew a box in the desert 150 kilometers by 150 kilometers and fill that box with solar power stations. You could produce all the electricity that Europe produces today from all its sources, from all its power stations. I'm not suggesting you should power Europe with one technology. We've got lots of clean energy technologies to use, and we should use a mix of them. But uh, uh, that, that, that just shows that this is quite doable. Uh, again, there's no technical difficulty with generating as much power as we need forever. Remember, this, this fuel source is absolutely free, and it never runs out. Basically, what it boils down to with renewable energy is that we have a nuclear power station safely situated 93 million miles from the Earth, which is a good distance, uh, that will supply our needs forever. And all we have to do through, through wind turbines, mirrors, solar panels, uh, hyd hydro turbines and so on, is capture in energy terms the energy that arrives on the planet from the sun in one hour to power the whole world economy for one year. That is not beyond the capacity of the human race to do. We have the technology to do it right now. 
All we lack is the political will, and that's why the Climate Parliament is organizing groups of politicians in countries all over the world to, uh, to, to put the heat on their governments to get this transition happening. So for you then it's renewables, it's not the nuclear option as some environmentalists are now beginning to argue. Personally, if I were to put my money on a big global solution over the next decade or so, which is what we have to be thinking of, uh, I would put it on renewable energy. Uh, the UK Met Office is, is a pretty mainstream group of climate scientists and they're telling us, as are most of their peers in other countries, that we have to, if we're going to have even an even chance of not exceeding two degrees global temperature increase in this century, we have to see global emissions of carbon dioxide peak in this decade and then reduce by 5% a year globally. That's a speed and scale of transition that almost no government is even imagining today. Uh, and to my mind, if we're going to achieve that speed and scale, we have to go with technology that is ready now, that exists now, that's working now. And it, it, down the renewable road, we have those technologies already. So by contrast with nuclear power, you've got some problems. If you try to think of switching the world energy supply to nuclear over the next 10 years, or at least beginning that very rapid transition in the next 10 years, Firstly, you've got a problem with public acceptance. You know, people don't want to be the next Fukushima and, uh, or the next Chernobyl. You know, it's quite dangerous technology. We, we, we've seen that already. Um, and uh, whereas, whereas solar, wind, hydro, these are very safe technologies, you know, and especially if you do them, do the solar and wind in places where not a lot of people live, like offshore wind or desert solar, you just don't have a lot of public resistance. Secondly, you, you, you've got a problem with fuel supply with nuclear. Various studies have been done that suggest that if you powered the whole world from nuclear, from the existing technologies that we have powered by uranium, the uranium would run out perhaps within a decade. It isn't a long-term solution because you're, you're still dealing with a finite power supply. Um, thirdly, the cost is a, an issue. The cost seems to be going up rather than down. It's a fairly, you know, it's a technology that's been with us for a long time now, and, uh, and, and, and yet it's still, you look at what Britain is having to do to get people to build power nuclear power stations in Britain today, it still needs all kinds of public subsidies and support. And finally, you do have this problem of nuclear waste. Now, what Mark Linus says is very interesting about how future technologies might solve that problem. But again, I come back to the point that we need to go with existing technologies right now. When there's power stations that can munch up nuclear waste and make it safe, fantastic. I'll be delighted. I, I, I have no sort of uh, uh, the, theological opposition to nuclear power. But I don't want to gamble the future of the world on a technology that isn't there yet. You know, I, I want to use technology technologies that we know work that aren't going to have uh, uh, overwhelming political or technical problems. So then what's the way forward? What, what do we need to do? What we have to do, whether we go with nuclear or renewables, what we have to do to solve the climate problem is to build our way out of it. This, this is not a negotiating problem. There's too much emphasis, I think, on you know, a global negotiation with 200 governments trying to reach agreement on carbon emissions targets and so on. We need to see this as a construction project where we're building long distance uh, transmission lines linking everybody to the areas where energy clean energy is most abundant, like the deserts and the, and the windy seas and the windy coastlines and the mountain ranges. Um, we need to be uh, 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 helping private investors to put a lot of money into building the generating capacity in those places. And one way to do that is to have governments and multilateral agencies share the risk in the bond market, for example. You could have renewable energy bonds raising billions or hundreds of billions of dollars for renewable energy. Uh, but if we can do that, and there's no reason why we shouldn't do it, then uh, uh, there's absolutely no technical uh, obstacle to very rapidly uh, 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 transforming the global energy supply. You've got to remember... How, how rapidly? 
Well, if I were to take a historical analogy that everybody knows, think of wartime. You know, if you think of the Second World War, the combatant countries didn't call in their economists and technologists and, 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 and say, how many years or decades will it take to transform our economy into a war economy? They said, do it now. Do it in weeks or months, not years. Whatever it takes, we're going to do it. Whatever it costs, we're going to do it uh, to win this war. Uh, you know, within a matter of months after Pearl Harbor, the United States had transformed itself into an invincible war machine. Now, we don't need to do anything like a, tra a, a transformation on that scale to solve the climate problem. What we need to do to solve the climate problem is just change the source of the electricity that comes out of the plug in the wall. And most people don't really care where that electricity comes from, just so long as when they plug in their television, it works, you know. So um, uh, it's, 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 you know, it, it's a relatively, it's a kind of transition that's happening all the time. Look at IT and the internet. It's transformed the world economy. What we have to do to stop climate change and protect the planet is, is no more than that. Give me some examples from Europe now as to how some of the first steps are being taken. Well, in the new European budget that's been negotiated just in the last few weeks, which sets the EU budget for the next seven years, it's called the Multiannual Financial Framework, there is a budget now called the Connecting Europe Facility, and our group of members of the European Parliament and the Climate Parliament group in the European Parliament have been pushing for as much money as possible to go into helping to build that Europe-Mediterranean supergrid to uh, enable us to make the transition to renewables faster. And there are some billions of euros over the next seven years now assigned to that task, to building what the European Commission is calling electricity highways, connecting us all to those areas rich in, 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 in renewables. Um, so the, the, the European Union has by and large accepted the idea that we should have a single market stretching from North Africa to Scandinavia for electricity and that that's necessary for a large-scale transition to renewables. It's just, it's like everything else on climate change. The right things are happening, but they're not happening fast enough. They're not, they're not happening on a big enough scale. And that's where governments have to take the lead. You know, the, we can't just leave this to the marketplace. We need a five-year plan globally. And I don't mean a five-year, you know, a, I, I, I don't mean a, a formal five-year plan globally. I just mean we need to think in terms of the next five years. For another five years, the world's governments need to give a big push to renewable energy. The cost of solar and wind and other renewable technologies is falling very fast, much faster even than some might have hoped a few years ago. And if we can just keep government support going for a few years, the, uh, those renewable technologies will be able to compete with fossil fuels in the open marketplace without subsidy, particularly if we stop spending five to six hundred billion dollars a year on subsidies for the fossil fuel industries. Right now, we spend six times as much subsidizing fossil fuels as we spend subsidizing renewables. If you just switch some of those subsidies from fossil fuels to renewables, or even just remove the subsidies that make fossil fuels so artificially cheap, you'll see that uh, very quickly we'll reach the point where the market will, will bring about an energy transition globally. That, that negotiators from 200 governments might take 30 years to achieve, the market will do it in a decade because once renewables are cheaper, politically safer, uh, uh, you know, people are going to go for the cheaper, safer power source. You know, this is a global solution that works. It works forever. It's not that expensive in term, terms of energy investment. The amounts required are not that big. Um, so we should get on and do it. So lastly, what's your realistic prospect of when we shall have this? Are we talking about one decade, two decades? The building program needs to start in earnest in this decade, and that's what virtually all the world's climate scientists are telling us increasingly urgently. Uh, it doesn't have to be completed in this decade. It's a 30-40 it's a year project between now and 2050. Uh, but we need to be scaling up the production facilities to build large-scale renewables. Uh, we need to have the ships for installing offshore wind turbines. We need floating, simple, cheap floating wind turbines that you can scatter across the windy oceans. We need a lot of mirrors to, to concentrate that sun, a lot of solar panels. 
but the the materials that we need to do that are not in short supply. You know, mirrors are made from silicon. Silicon's what beaches are made of. You you know, we don't have a problem. The world has plenty of sand. So uh, uh, it's just really an, an industrial challenge that the governments have to address. The governments have to create a policy environment where it's good business for big investors to put money in building clean power generation sources. And, and this, is, this is not rocket science. This, this is pretty straightforward policy making, uh, and, and we can do it. Nick, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.